Hello and welcome to this SEMA E2 Enterprise Management training video from the EXP Group. We're on page 9 of our express notes and we're going to have a look at something known as Porter's Value Chain. Michael Porter, Michael Porter's Value Chain. Now what this model does, it almost has an overview of a business and it has a bird's eye view of how a business runs and it's divided into primary activities and support activities and within the primary activities you have inbound logistics getting the raw materials into the organization operations what the company actually does outbound logistics getting the product to the customers marketing and sales which is as the name suggests marketing and sales and then any after sales service such as warranties, guarantees and so on. At the support level, these support the primary functions. So we have procurement, technological development, HR and the overall firm infrastructure. And according to Porter, the way an, an organisation manages these links, manages these functions, can create value and the difference between what is charged as output and the total cost of all of these items represents a margin. What is key for organizations is how they manage the links between the various functions and as a very simple example if we were looking at a restaurant for example within operations that's the chef that's a cook cooking the food, he or she would need to make sure that inbound logistics were aware of what items, what raw materials needed to get into the chain. The value chain is also useful for enabling an organisation to identify which one of these are the more important ones. Again, using this example of a restaurant, if the restaurant is a fresh fish restaurant, then they really have to make sure they get the inbound logistics right. After all, it doesn't matter how well you, you cook the food, if the fresh fish isn't there, it's not going to work as a fresh fish restaurant. Outbound logistics. Um, if the restaurant is a pizza delivery, you've got to be able to deliver the pizza, for example. Okay, that's uh, Michael Porter's value chain. If we move on to the next page. Now on this page, we've got these two boxes and this talks all about types of research how do we obtain data to enable us to do our environmental analysis two boxes one talks about quantitative research and the other one is qualitative research quantitative try to think of that as quantity so it's almost an analysis of numerical data it tends to be more objective statistical tests whereas the other one is more based around this concept of quality so how it's analyzed it's more subjective compared to the objective of quantitative and how can you obtain the qualitative research well maybe use something known as a focus group that's where a group of people are invited in and a facilitator would be talking with them to get their ideas, get their views. Okay, moving on to page 11. On page 11, we have another one of Michael Porter's theories. This one is Porter's Five Forces. And very well known, very well known model and uh, a very useful model as well. Michael Porter argues that there are five forces, five pressures close to an organization that impact on its ability to make a profit. So one, two, three, four, five pressures. If we have a quick look through these. First one is entrance, new entrance, potential entrance. So 
how likely is it that new entrants will enter the market? That the more new entrants that are coming in, the more competitive it's going to be, and arguably the prices will be driven down within that market. An important thing that could prevent new entrants coming into the market will be something known as a barrier to entry. Barrier to entry. A barrier to entry could, for example, be a government license. If we're looking at the mobile phone industry, a good example of a barrier to entry would be a government license because you cannot operate a mobile phone business within a country without a government license. If you don't have it, well, that's a barrier. You're not going to be able to enter the market. If you look at suppliers, this measures the force or the, the power of the suppliers. And obviously, dependent on the number of other potential suppliers there are, how unique the item that is being supplied is, this will have an impact on the, the power of the force of the supplier. If, for example, we were looking at a company, Coca-Cola, and one of their suppliers were the sugar manufacturers, well, arguably they would not have a lot of power because Coke would be the dominant player in that relationship. And also sugar is a fairly homogenous product, relatively easy to replace as a supply. This measures the force of customers. So if you look on the customer side of things, so how much power, how much force does a customer have on that business? Substitute products. It's important you, you're aware of the difference between competition and substitute products. So Coca-Cola, which we talked about a moment ago, substitute product would be orange juice, milk, water. Competition would be Pepsi-Cola, for example. Now what Michael Porter said is an organisation should look at these five forces to ascertain which ones really are the more dangerous ones, which ones should be addressed, which ones should be looked at. And then if you go to the next page, just to finish off this chapter, it's uh, another theory by Michael Porter, Porter's Diamond. And Porter's Diamond is also known as the competitive advantage of nations. And this model, this theory, argues that certain industries are good in certain countries. So certain industries have a strength in certain countries, and this is driven by the competitive advantage of that particular nation. Four factors which are shown in a diamond shape, and hence the name Porter's Diamond. We have the factor conditions. So what are the raw materials that are present in that country? What are the HR conditions that are present? Demand conditions. What's the home demand conditions like? related and supporting industries. So is there a, a banking function, a developed banking function within that country? And then what's the level of rivalry within that particular country within a particular industry? And Porter's view is that the more intense a rivalry, the more innovation will be present, the more competitive an industry would be. OK, so that's a, a very quick run through the remainder of chapter one. Um, thank you very much for listening to the video.